This is the last ethics and AI seminar for the semester. Um, so we're, we're ending on a, a really positive or depending on how that slide turns out, negative note here for the, for the last talk. Um, but today we are super excited to have uh, Moritz Hart here with us. He's a professor at Berkeley. Um, I've known him for a long time and I carefully follow all of the publications that appear um, with his name on it. He got his PhD from Princeton um, and uh, worked at IBM Research and also at Google. And he's co uh, uh, the co-founder of the of uh, Fat ML, the workshop on fairness, accountability, and transparency in machine learning. He's um, he has a new book coming out: Patterns, Predictions, and Actions: A Story About Machine Learning. I have gotten a sneak peek of that book, and I recommend it. And he's also uh, won many best paper awards, uh, has a career award and a Sloan Fellowship, and we're uh, thrilled to have you here to uh, to end things on a high note, Moritz. So uh, take it away. All right, I'll, I'll try not to disappoint and we'll see how the numbers turn out when Ludwig adds it in. So, um, all right, so are we recording already? Okay, good. Let me um, share my screen. And by the way, Moritz, I, if, 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 you, if, you, if there's some questions in the chat, I will interrupt you as needed. And I, knowing Moritz, I'm sure he's happy to have anyone just interrupt them in the middle of the yeah, talk and ask sure. questions. Um, so just go ahead. I actually have the, um, a second screen here with a, the chat open. Uh, and um, the participants tab. So I should see you when, or I should see when you either raise your hand or have a, you know, um, just type a message in the chat, I'll work. All right, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much to the organizers for inviting me and thank you all for joining. Uh, really happy to be part of this uh, seminar series. And um, I want to, uh, you know, face an adult problem in this talk and tell you a little bit about some efforts to create new data sets for uh, fairness and machine learning research. And this is um, an ongoing joint work with um, Francis Ding, uh, John Miller, and Ludwig Schmidt. Some of them might be in the room, so they can also uh, answer questions if they come up. So what is this all about? So um, probably most of you know that data sets, um, you know, in machine learning are mostly uh, interpreted as benchmarks. So we think of data sets and as kind of an interesting thing about machine learning, we think of data sets as benchmarks. You know, we think of them as like uh, something that you use to compare methods and how well they work, okay? So there are all these things you've heard about like ImageNet and, and CIFAR and MNIST and all these well-known benchmark data sets as well as many Kaggle competitions and such things. And they all sort of work the same way. You split your data into a training set and a test set, and you, um, you know, you're allowed to, your code is allowed to run on the training set, but then you get a model and you're evaluating the model on the test set and you're comparing different models on the test set, how well they work, you can rank them, see which one is best and improve over previous efforts. And so this is, has become so central to machine learning that we kind of take it for granted today. It's fueled many advances in the last decade, um, you know, especially uh, surrounding deep learning and, and, and domains like vision, speech, and text. Um, and so it's kind of easy to imagine that it's always been this way, that you know, machine learning always operated this way. But this idea of sort of data sets as benchmarks is actually much more recent than uh, machine learning, the field. Um, and it emerged sometime in the 1980s. And there's this quote by Pat um, Langley in a 2011, uh, 2011 retrospective on machine learning, where he says this kind of experimental movement, what I just described, was aided by another development. David Aha, then a PhD student at UCI, began to collect data sets for use in empirical studies of machine learning. This grew into the UCI machine learning repository, which he made available to the community by FDP in 1987. This was rapidly adopted by many researchers because it was easy to use and because it let them compare their results to previous findings on the same task. So I let all of you, you know, the young folks in this room, uh, you know, ask Adam after the talk what FTP is. I'm not going to explain it now, but it was something that, you know, people used back then to transfer files on the internet. Um, and so, yeah, people started putting up these data sets in the 1980s and using them as benchmarks. So what is this UCI machine learning repository? I'm sure some of you have seen this before. This is what it looks like. It has this uh, badger, uh, you know, is that a badger actually? Has some kind of icon. 
Um, and it lists a bunch of popular data sets on its website. And so the, the most popular one on this uh, machine learning repository is, uh, you know, Ron Fisher's uh, famous iris data set uh, that's been around for a long time. And then the, the, the three, four, and five here are something I don't know. It's, you know, something about wine and heart disease. I've never actually looked at uh, those three. I'm not exactly sure who's using them. And so this talk is actually going to be about the second one, um, the adult data set, and why it became sort of the unlikely protagonist of my talk and why, you know, I'm going to spend the next 40 or 50 minutes talking, talking to you about it. Okay. I think that's an anteater. Sorry? I think it's an anteater. It's not a badger. It's Peter, Peter, the, Peter is the face of UCI, I believe. Oh, it's, oh, it's, it's the, it's Peter the anteater. Yeah, there you go. It's Peter the anteater, yes. <laughs> okay, it's an anteater. Okay, I learned something. It's not a badger, it's, it's an anteater. Uh, excellent. Uh, okay, so let me tell you about the UCI adult data set. So what's, what's the adult data set? It's about 25 years old. It was donated in 1996. Um, it has 14 attributes and it has about 50,000 instances. And basically the entire description is uh, predict whether income exceeds $50,000 a year based on census data, also known as census income data set. You can download it, it has some missing values. It's been used a bunch um, for classification and prediction. And uh, there is a tiny sort of blurb of, of description about it, which says that extraction was done by Barry Becker from the 1994 census database and a set of reasonably clean records was extracted using some criteria, some filters, I suppose, that were you know, available in the database at the time. And the prediction task is, determine, um, is to determine whether a person makes over $50,000 a year, okay? It was donated by Ronnie Covey and Barry Becker uh, back then at uh, Silicon Graphics. And it says they can email K at life.com for questions. More on that later, okay? So uh, we, we might actually email K at life.com to see what happens. So if you look at the uh, list of attributes and then that's really all you have about this data set, you get some, some like very glib description of these 14 attributes. You can see uh, there's some stuff in there like age, um, you know, working worker class, uh, education um, level, education numbers about the same, marital status, occupation coded in uh, these few fields here, relationship status, uh, a race encoding uh, here uh, encoded as white, Asian Pacific Islander, American Indian Eskimo, other in black. That was apparently a racial encoding uh, used by the Census Bureau at the time. Sex coded as female, male, capital gain, capital losses, hours per week, um, and native country, which is country of origin and some subset of countries here. So that's basically the entire data set and the entire description that you have about this data set. So why am I talking about this data set? Well, um, it became, uh, you know, the go-to data set in, um, you know, fairness and machine learning research. Um, and it all started with a couple of papers back in, the, uh, back in 2009 and 2010. Uh, papers by Calders, Kamiran, Peshaninsky, Peshaninsky, and Calders and Berber. And they basically started using this um, data set to build classifiers that satisfied some kind of fairness constraint. Like, you know, uh, in, this class, in this paper, building classifiers with independency constraints, they tried to uh, get a classifier that's independent of the uh, sex attribute. So that has no correlation with the sex attribute. So, uh, and then there was this three night base approaches for discrimination free classification. And I should note there was an earlier paper on this topic, which is basically the first on this topic, or at least uh, algorithmic fairness in some sense, by Podresky, Ruggieri, and Torini, um, and that also used an UCI data set, which for some reason, it's even older, even smaller, and, and it didn't sort of catch on, uh, and that's the UCI German credit data, okay? But it's still, you still see that used sometimes. So what happened? I asked Toon uh, why he actually, uh, you know, used this data set back then, and he, uh, he got back to me. He said the main interest for picking this data set at the time were the presence of a sensitive attribute, in this case gender, the base rates for males and females are different, in this case meaning they're, uh, the, they're more, uh, um, there were more men uh, uh, at, above the income threshold of $50,000, and the label itself can be considered ground truth, but he clarifies this in a very nuanced way, he says, you know, at least there is no measurement bias affecting the label. Um, of course, the structural inequality in the income distribution 
um, but uh, there is at least no measurement bias directly affecting uh, the label of greater or less than $50,000 because that was presumably uh, collected by the Census Bureau in, a, in an accurate manner. Okay. And so then there was some sporadic uh, work on uh, fairness in machine learning from 2010 to 2016. Uh, a bunch of papers started using UCI Adult. 2016 was this watershed moment where you know a lot of things happened and many people started working on fairness in machine learning. So in 2017, there were more papers on this topic. You don't have to read them all, but they all using UCI Adult. 2018, even more papers using UCI Adult. 2019, even more papers. And 2020, you know, sort of getting out of control. Uh, there are dozens of, of papers um, using UCI Adult for all sorts of purposes, from learning fair representations to uh, causal analysis and fairness to um, you know a privacy and fairness. So it's used not just in sort of one pocket of this research community, but it's actually used across the board for all sorts of uh, tasks, right, and all sorts of questions about fairness. So this becomes was this the slide? Was this the slide that Ludwig just made? This, one? this is the slide that Ludwig just made. Ludwig just edited in all these, uh, you know, uh, 300 papers uh, as we spoke. Uh, he's really high bandwidth. Okay. So uh, anyway, so we counted more than 300 papers on algorithmic fairness that use UCI adult as a benchmark. And so that's, uh, you know, what I want to talk about. Um, you know, uh, I'll start with some archaeology of the UCI adult data, uh, where it came from, what it actually is. Um, you know, the influence it, ha it, it has uh, and sort of the, the issues that this data set has as well. Um, that's what I call ar archaeology. And then I'll describe to you or give you a sneak peek of a new software package that um, we built, uh, which creates new data sets from US Census data products. And there are actually a bunch of them. And you can get a lot of interesting data sets by wrapping around the US Census data products. And I'll show you uh, a glimpse um, at these new data sets and some of the empirical findings, uh, you know, that we see on these, these data sets. And with those findings in mind, um, you know, we're going to revisit some existing narratives on algorithmic fairness, which were, you know, sort of in many cases came from um, more limited data sources. Um, and so we're going to see how they, how they hold up on the new data. I just admitted Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Thanks for joining. Um, you know, shout out to our audience in Seattle. Um, cool. All right. You didn't miss anything. Just 300 papers. <laughs> okay. So um, let me start with uh, the archaeology part. Um, so where does it come from? You know, we dug it up, so to speak. And to um, tell you about it, I need to give you sort of a brief tour of your census data products. And this might be new to some of you. Um, you know, from the computer science community, because we're not used to working with census data necessarily. We mostly know the US Census Bureau for the decennial census. So once every 10 years, everybody gets like a, a mail in questionnaire that hopefully all of you filled out last year, there was the 2020 census. And, um, you know, that's what the census uses to sort of have an accurate count of the population and so forth. But there are many other surveys that the uh, US Census Bureau conducts and that they turn into high quality data products and have a long tradition and history of building. Okay, so they're extensive annual surveying efforts. And several of these publicly, uh, several of these uh, data sets are publicly available. Um, you just have to go to the website. Um, a, a lot of it is aggregate statistics and tables because the Census Bureau has a mandate to protect privacy, individual privacy and so forth. But they also release for some of the data products microdata samples, so public use microdata samples. And one of those um, data products is the American Community Survey, which is the largest household survey in the United States. It gives you comprehensive information on social economic housing data, and it's sort of designed to give you information at different states, different communities, um, and, um, you know, it's basically um, you know, a mandatory annual survey. So when you get this form, you're supposed to, um, you know, fill it out and, and, and return it. Um, and it replaced the long form census questionnaire. So for those of you who were around, well, I think it's probably a while back. I don't, you know, I wasn't around for that. But at some point, the, the census, the decennial census had like a long form questionnaire that some people got. The ACS basically replaced that. 
Okay, so it's mailed out to approximately 3.5 million households each year. So it's a huge survey and gets a lot of responses. So I read somewhere that's about 70% responses. And what's released to the public is this thing called PUMS, so public use microdata sample, um, which you can get directly from the census data uh, from the census uh, bureau website. Okay, there's another important survey. So ACS is one of them. The other one I want to tell you about is the current population survey. This is a non mandatory monthly phone and in person survey. It's sent out to about 60,000 occupied US households each month. Um, you know, this could be mostly by phone or, or you know, uh, some interviews go around apparently in person. And there is um, an annual version of it called the Annual Social and Economic Supplement to uh, the CBS, and that's called ASAC. And this one has even more detailed economic information relating to income and employment and so on. Okay. Jamie says, if you didn't do your census, don't complain about the electoral college. Okay, I'll, I'll leave that PSA in the chat. So, and yeah, I mean, if you've been following over the last a year, um, when, when you see unemployment numbers, uh, you know, and the, the, the terrifying effects of the pandemic, um, they come from the monthly CPS. Okay, so it's in a very important and vital uh, survey. So, um, there are several notable differences between the ACS and the CPS. You might say how they're different. Well, you can look at, uh, there are some fact sheet that you can access later. One of them is one is much bigger and mandatory. The other one is smaller uh, and uh, monthly, but also more detailed, okay? So the first thing we did in our uh, archeology span project is to actually reconstruct the UCI data set to understand where it came from and what uh, census data source it actually came out of. Okay, so um, we were basically able to match all these 4,000, uh, 40,800, sorry, 48,842 records in the UCI data set uh, uniquely to available census data. And the source uh, data set was actually the 1994 uh, current population survey um, ASAC. So the um, the, um, the, the annual uh, appendum that, to that survey that I just mentioned. And it's available from a service called IPUMS, which it took us a while to figure out because it's not actually on the Census Bureau, it's on some other service that for some reason is called IPUMS and IPUMS CPS hosts the, the CPS data. Um, it's also pretty tricky because all the attribute names have changed and the encodings have changed. Uh, and so you sort of need to be clever about how you match them. And some countries in the IPUM CPS are coded as unknown in the UCI. Del Ludwig just and I just had a one hour chat about which two countries was it? I, I don't remember, but some something that didn't match. So anyway, let me just mention that IPUMS is not to be confused. Oh yeah, there we go. IPUMS is not to be confused with PUMS. Uh, yes, they know that was a terrible name, um, but IPUMS has nothing to do with the census pumps. It's just another, another name, okay? So, but if you want the data, you have to go to IPUMS. We basically succeeded in recovering all the columns, all the features that were in the UCI adult data set with one exception, this column called AFNLWGT, which is probably a final weight or something. Um, and so we did email a Ronnie K at life.com uh, 25 years later after he wrote that description and gave you uh, his email address. And to my surprise, he basically almost replied immediately. You know, I sent him an email like shortly before the, uh, you know, the holiday um, break and he got back immediately, but unfortunately he said, you know, final weight came from the census and the description was copied into this thing that I showed you earlier. And that's really all we have, okay? So unfortunately we could not recover a final weight. It's lost. We don't know what a final weight is and where it came from, but um, it's not so important because it's probably just a sampling weight um, that was used at the time, later replaced, and there are many other sampling weights um, in, the, in, the, in the census data that you can use. But note, though, that sampling weights should not be used for prediction anyway, because they're kind of external to the features, right? I mean, there's something about the sampling frame and the relationship between the sampling frame and the data set, but they're not a feature of the individual that you want to predict from. Okay, so it's basically doesn't make sense to use them for prediction anyway. All right, so let me you know reflect on UCI adult, right? So some things I like about it, some things that are problematic about it, right? And why do we go about, why do we need different data sets, right? 
So first of all, one good thing about it is that it kind of uses the established, um, you know, um, data collection standards by the U.S. Census Bureau, right? It's, um, you know, inheriting kind of, you know, all the knowledge that the Census Bureau has established over the decades on how to do surveys well. And so it, it uses the same quality sampling frame capturing the U.S. population. It was created by skilled and compensated labor in contrast to a lot of, uh, you know, MTERB data collection happening in machine learning, which is poorly compensated and, uh, you know, often unskilled labor. And there's thorough documentation, okay? So in many ways, the census data already arguably avoid some of the known issues with other machine learning data sets that have been raised in a, in a number of important works. For instance, the gender sheets paper by Bolomini and Gebru, the data sheets paper, by Gebru and uh, Jamie and, and others. Um, and also a paper I really like, Lessons from the Archives by Joan Gebru, which points out some of these issues. A book by Gray and Suri, which talks about, you know, labor that goes into AI and the sort of mechanical Turk data collection business. And so these are just some of the papers that point out issues with existing uh, data sets and machine learning. And you could argue that at, at least the US Census Bureau, uh, you know, the data that they release addresses some of these issues in a, in a reasonable way, okay? So that's something, something that's good about relying on US Census data, okay? Or uh, data provided and created by the Census Bureau, okay? But there are some pretty serious issues with UCI adult, which is why I was always pretty um, worried about the community using this data set. And, um, you know, I was worried that we're sort of like, um, you know, kind of, uh, getting misleading conclusions out of this. So first of all, st to state the obvious, it's 75, uh, 25 years old. So it's pretty old or more than 25 years old. Um, the census encodings for uh, racial identity have changed substantially than then, uh, since then, allowing for a much richer intersectionality and, and, and sort of combinations of, of racial uh, uh, identities that are now included in the data that weren't there back then. And you saw the racial encoding earlier was pretty um, outdated. Um, and so uh, the other thing is the US Census data actually includes all these different geographies, state information, as well as many other features relating to the household. Um, UCI adult certainly kind of underutilizes the census data sources and the wealth of data that's actually provided by the Census Bureau. And then the third, which awarded me the most, to be honest, is that $50,000 is actually a high income cutoff. It's way above the median income. And that leads to some, uh, you know, uh, noticeable peculiarities. For instance, the all less than 50K baseline uh, achieves 93% accuracy in the, in the black population, meaning that in this data set, 93% uh, of the black population uh, have income less than $50,000. And so generally models have higher accuracy on the black population than the white population. The same is true for higher accuracy on, on the female population than the male population. So the story about UCI adult is sort of opposite from what is often the concern in fairness and machine learning that somehow we get less accuracy or we get poor performance on, on um, historically underrepresented and disadvantaged uh, populations. So somehow this data set doesn't at all reflect that, right? And so, now that we've reconstructed this, we can actually vary this income threshold, um, which isn't possible if you just have the UCI data because it has these labels fixed, right? And doesn't tell you what the income actually was. It just gives you greater than 50,000 or less than 50,000. But since we reconstructed it, we can uh, vary the threshold, the income threshold from zero to here 75,000. Um, and we can see what happens to the accuracy of a baseline and, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of state-of-the-art model gradient boosted decision trees, which gets roughly peak accuracy on this model. And you can see this dip um, of the red line, the majority class baseline at about 20, what is that, $7,000. That is the median income in the United States at the time. And so if you just say, if you just make a majority prediction, right, you see either say either, either everyone is below 50,000 or above 50,000, then uh, you get the accuracy of the majority class baseline, which at, reaches 50% at the median income. And then it goes up uh, to the right and it goes up to the left. And so you can also look at what the, this model, the gradient boosted decision tree, 
gets on the entire test set and gets on the white population and the black population respectively. And what you'll see is, um, yeah, Jamie, go ahead, ask your question. Yeah, my question is about uh, why classification versus re regression if you actually have these, these uh, incomes, right? Uh, because I, I, I imagine sort of no matter where you threshold, right, you're gonna have some weird things. Um, and I'm curious if you had some reason other than like adding another data set that has classification as its, as its target rather than regression, uh, why you're looking at that. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so let me first maybe finish this point that I was going to make and then talk about regression for a second. So um, the point I wanted to make is that basically below the you know, median income level, uh, what you see is that the model gets higher accuracy on uh, the white population, and lower accuracy on the black population. That reverses around the median income threshold where it goes the other way around. And then actually, um, you know, the crossover point is roughly at the median. But at the cutoff where, um, you know, UCI adult has this cutoff of $50,000, the gradient boosted uh, model uh, is no better than the baseline for the black population, right? If both of them get about 93% accuracy. And so basically the model isn't doing anything non-trivial in that uh, population, okay? So it's a pretty sort of extreme case where actually nothing is happening. And so I was, you know, always worried that, well, there are all these papers doing this, but this is sort of an, an extreme regime where nothing, um, nothing interesting seems to happen. The same is true if you look at male and female population. Uh, and in fact, here it's even more extreme. Uh, there are crossover points again, roughly at the median income level, but the differences are even bigger. And so in fact, the 50K threshold that's in UCI adult uh, is the one that maximizes the difference between female and male accuracy, okay? So it's actually the one where like, um, you know, you get about 95% uh, in the female population and about 85% uh, in, the, in the male population, okay? So it's a, it's a pretty big difference. And again, this speaks to the fact that this threshold of 50,000 is kind of at the extreme end. All right, so now why classification and not regression? A couple of different answers. I think, you know, the fairness community um, has studied a lot of these uh, discrete decisions, right? Like, you know, uh, settings where you accept or reject someone. And I think there's something to be said about studying the case where you actually have to accept or reject someone as opposed to just building a score. Because if you only built a score, it's sort of like, well, what do you do with it, right? I mean, you know, the decision is kind of missing, right? And so I think it makes sense to uh, think about decision points. But yeah, from a data set creation uh, perspective, it doesn't necessarily make sense to throw out the, the income perspective, uh, the income, the income uh, feature, right? And the, the number, right? The numerical value. And it would have helped us to, to have that, right? And then this, at least you could have done without reconstructing the data. So yeah, great question. All right, so the, you know, what I wanna talk to you about for the rest of the talk is, can we get the best of the census data? Like sort of the advantages of the rigorous census bureau data collection while addressing the issues with the UCI adult data. And I actually wanna take a brief look at the clock. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, so yeah, um, are there any questions at this point? Because I'm gonna take a step back and give you a little bit more context about the state of algorithmic fairness so that you can better appreciate some of the empirical findings. But I'm basically gonna give you like a, a brief, uh, you know, tour of fairness and classification yeah, in a hurry, maybe 15 minutes or so, um, so that we all have shared context on this. Any questions so far? Do you know where they picked 50,000 as their threshold for? Do you know why they picked the 50,000? Yeah. I don't. Um, I, I should have asked uh, Ronnie K at life.com when I had the chance. I used my bullet on the uh, final weight column. Uh, I'm also curious. But there's one more bullet in the gun, which is uh, Barry Becker also has an email address. So maybe when we email Barry Becker, we'll ask him about the 50,000. I have no idea where they picked 50,000. Do Just, we have to know, was that like upper quartile in 1994? Um, yeah, well, you can look at what it was, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm wondering, right? I'm just trying to do some like... <laughs> yeah, 75%, it's roughly 75%, right? So the majority baseline, 
gets about 75% uh, accuracy at the 50,000 level. So that could be like 75%, yeah. Um, Jessica, you had a question. Uh, yeah, so um, they said that there is no uh, bias in measurement, but you mentioned that 30% of the people were not answering. Is there like correlation between who is not answering and the groups? Yeah, so this is there. I'm sure there is, and this is where the sampling weights weights come in. So I think one of the things that the uh, sampling weights that the Census Bureau uh, provides are supposed to do is adjust for like non responses, so that you you kind of have you understand how much you would have to reweight the the responses that you have to get something that's consistent with a uh, demographic markup of the the uh, sampling frame, the U.S. population. Um, so yeah, it's it's possible that there's a source of, um, you know, uh, response bias there that could systematically align with, you know, race or sex. Okay, thanks. There was another. No, that was still your hand. Okay, so looks like everyone had a chance to ask their question. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go on with a little bit of a look at. Um, what fairness in classification is and, and what people are talking about in that area. So formal work on fairness in classification and decision making actually goes way back and it goes back to the 60s and pioneering work of uh, Anne Cleary in the educational testing community. There was also notable work in economics by Gary Becker and then Phelps and Arrow, um, you know, sort of on the heels of the civil rights movement. People thought about this and they created formal models to talk about uh, discrimination. Um, either in um, educational testing settings or in, in, in the labor force. Um, and so as far as computer science concerned, most of the work started in 2008. I mean, there was the Podreski paper in 2008. It was sort of a slow pickup. And then there was a lot of work after 2016. And um, formally, no, nothing too much has changed. It's just that somehow now we recognize that all these algorithmic decisions are being put into place in, in a lot of important consequential settings. Um, and so the urgency scale and, and so reach of this whole uh, topic or a whole uh, question is, is sort of uh, new and, and unprecedented. And machine learning kind of fuels this adoption, right? And uh, the narratives we have around machine learning push uh, this way of making decisions into new, uh, new settings. Um, and so we're not really facing a new problem, but we're facing sort of new uh, normative questions about where we want this and what we want and don't want. And so um, most of the formal work in this uh, area um, has a very simple setup, a very simple formal setting where you describe your uh, covariates by feature vector X. Uh, you have an outcome variable Y, um, sometimes called target variable. That would be, for instance, whether your income is greater or less than 50,000. And our goal is to predict from uh, Y from X, OK? Um, and typically, the way we do this is we use supervised machine learning to produce a score function R. Um, that is a function of the features. And then we make a binary decision according to a threshold rule um, that uh, just uh, looks at whether the score is greater than T or not. Okay, this is the standard sort of statistical decision-making setup. And we think of these as all random variables in the same probability space. So the probability space models the population, I say the US population, and these are all random variables in the same probability space. So. Uh, the diagram that you should have in mind is that there's data set, there's a process called learning that gives you a model like a score function, then we threshold that score function and that gives you a decision, okay? How do, you, do these scores come about? Well, it could be based on some parametric model like a likelihood ratio test. These things are sort of optimal in theory. It could be a non-parametric score such as the, you know, there's the conditional expectation of the outcome given the features. Um, that's again, something you might look at in, in theory. And in practice, most commonly, we learn these things from label data, OK? So we don't have sort of a, uh, a parametric model for our data generating process. So we just kind of throw in a bunch of labeled examples, run our favorite uh, optimizer, and get some kind of score function empirically from, from our label data points. OK. And so in decision theory, um, you know, when you have a binary outcome and binary decision, you get this kind of confusion table where you have a true negative, so you correctly say, uh, zero when the outcome is zero, you have a false positive when you say one and the outcome is actually zero. You have a false negative if you say zero and the outcome is one. 
and you have a true positive when both are one, okay? So that gives rise to these terms like true positive rate, which is the probability of making a positive call given that the outcome is positive. And you have things like the false positive rate, which is the probability of making a positive call given that your, your um, um, outcome is zero. And I'm gonna spare you all the other terms. There's basically for every corner of this um, confusion table, there are five different names. The only two names I'm gonna use in this talk are uh, true positive rate and false positive rate. And so then this is the setup. This is just decision theory. So what, how does fairness come in? And then the simplest form, what people do is they introduce an additional random variable, um, let's call it A, that encodes membership status in a designated group. Okay, so A could represent some encoding of racial identity or some encoding of gender identity or so forth, depending on what your uh, concern is and what your scenario is. And so in any of these uh, statistical fairness uh, questions, you equalize different statistical quantities involving group membership, okay? So you have all these random variables, you now have this other random variable called A, and now you're gonna normalize some statistical quantity like a true positive rate or false positive rate involving this group membership, okay? This is the idea that sort of dates back to this work by Anne Cleary, who studied uh, differences in educational testing that way. There's a beautiful paper by Hutchins and Mitchell that sort of talks about the, the history of this um, and Cleary work and the early work in educational testing and how it relates to computer science work today. What I'm gonna do is uh, review three common criteria. The ones that I think are most common, people will tell you there are at least 21 definitions or if not, you know, 210. Um, but actually I think there are about uh, three fundamentally that people keep proposing in various uh, you know, uh, sort of um, different ways of stating it and different approximations, different relaxations and so on. The first one I call demographic parity. And this is just equalizing the positive rate across all groups. So it's just saying that for any two groups, A and B, you're gonna require that the rate of making a positive decision in uh, group A is the same as the rate of making a positive decision in group B. So you're, you know, in the case of binary classification, your acceptance rate is equal in all groups. So you're sort of saying all groups have an equal stake to be uh, accepted. Um, and this is, this is what you're formalizing that way. This is probably the most common one. There are all sorts of variants, relaxations, equivalent formulations. Um, and one that I like, it's a bit more general. It works for all sorts of random variables. Instead, you say the, the decision D should be independent of the uh, protected attribute or the, the sensitive attribute A, okay? Uh, the group, the group status A. Okay, so independence is basically uh, sort of what you can, an easy way to rem remember this. Okay, and equal acceptance rate in particular follows if these two random variables are independent. Okay, but what, what is wrong with this or, you know, what is an issue that you might have with this? And this comes up usually when, when you try to think about what this means. Um, it doesn't actually necessarily rule out unfair practices. And this is one of the problems with these kind of criteria. For instance, you could have one unfair situation where you make good and informed decisions in one group, but you make poor arbitrary or random decisions in another group and you equalize positive rate, right? In the context of UCI adult, you actually see this play out because um, the accuracy uh, you know, in one group is not better than the baseline, right? So you might as well be random, you know, be like the all, the constant predictor in that group. And in the other group, you actually do something more interesting, okay? So, and this can happen sort of naturally if you have less data or poor data on one group, or as in the UCI adult case, uh, the, uh, the base rates are just, uh, you know, biased, okay? Um, one example that people, or that I think is, is where this also happened is the Framingham score for coronary heart disease that was created on a cohort of white men and then used for other patients. And uh, you quickly see that it sort of matters what it does in, in subpopulations more than sort of what the uh, acceptance rate is, okay? In particular, one way to say this more formally is that a positive call could be either a false positive or a true positive. And there's some moral intuition here that should trigger, which is that you shouldn't get to match true positives in one group with false positives in another group, right? I mean, I shouldn't be able to say, well, I'm gonna accept lots of qualified applicants in one group and to make up for that, I'm gonna accept lots of unqualified applicants in the other group so that the acceptance rates match, okay? 
Nevertheless, in some cases, this is uh, you know a criterion that people study, and it's probably the most uh, well-studied one. There was a very influential paper by Zemel et al. in 2013 called Learning Fair Representations, which also was developed and evaluated on UCI, UCI adult. Um, which basically tries to make uh, you know, create a representation of the data that's independent of the group attribute A. Um, and the idea is generally, and there's been a lot of follow-up work, the idea is generally that use deep learning tricks such as autoencoders, GANs, adversarial training, you name it, to train a representation of the data that is independent of the group membership while representing the original data as well as possible. Okay, so you're trying to make create an independent representation that retains as much information, whatever that means, about the original data as you can. Very influential idea, lots of papers on this topic now. Okay, goes back to this paper. Um, this is one, one of the many ways that you could try to achieve uh, independence, okay? The second criterion that people often study responds to this issue with independence that I described, and it therefore asks that you should not just, uh, or not uh, equalize the acceptance rate, but you should equalize the error rates, okay? And uh, I think Eric and I may be partners in crime on this, I don't know what how Eric feels about this these days, but um, basically I attribute um, one of these two constraints to Eric Price. So um, I don't know, um, maybe that's unfair to say. But anyway, so for any two groups, uh, you require that you know, or you require that all groups have the same false positive rate, and you require that all uh, groups have the same uh, false negative rate. Yeah, that's fine too. But I wanted to write true positive rate. Uh, instead of false negative rate. Um, yeah, so think of one as equalizing the false positive rate, the other equalizing the true positive rate. I just wrote it differently for some reason. Okay, so here's the, the thing about error rate parity. Uh, it's sort of what I call a post hoc criterion, okay? So at the decision time, when you have to make a decision about an applicant or whatever, you, uh, the decision maker, if you're the decision maker, you don't know who's a positive and a negative instance, right? You don't know the outcome, which may be in the future. Um, but in hindsight, someone can, somebody can collect a group of positive instances and a group of negative instances and check how they were classified, okay? And so uh, group differences in this kind of post hoc audit often strike people as unfair, right? If you sort of let positive instances from two groups walk into the bank and in one group, they all get rejected and the other group, they all get accepted for a loan, that should sort of trigger a moral intuition that something is, something is wrong, right? And this is kind of the, in my opinion, the moral intuition pump that this, uh, you know, criterion relies on. But some people also think that's a disadvantage because, well, what's the decision maker supposed to do uh, at decision time, right? How they're supposed to implement something that addresses this. And so um, that's why there's a third criterion that often enters the discussions around fairness and that's called calibration. Uh, and so what does calibration say? A score function is calibrated if you can interpret the score as a probability, okay? So you can sort of pretend that the score value is the rate of, or the probability of a positive outcome. Um, for, to for, state that formally, the probability that the outcome is one, given that the score says R is equal to R, okay? So you can pretend that the score is a probability, although it may not actually be one, right? So the score value R corresponds to a positive outcome rate of R, and you can extend this to talk about calibration by group where you say that even within groups, you want to be calibrated. Okay, so even if you take into account uh, group membership, you can still pretend that your score is a probability. Okay, um, yeah, you can ignore this as follows from some conditional independence statement, but basically the idea is uh, that within each group, if you see a score value of R, you know that the positive outcome rate is is R, okay? Um, and so calibration, unlike error rate parity, is kind of an a priori guarantee, okay? So the decision maker sees the score value of R and knows right then and there that um, this is what the frequency of positive outcomes is. So you know that somehow uh, when you see a score value of R, instances with that score value on average have this kind of positive outcome rate. So score 0.8 means that 80% of rate of heart failure on average over people who receive a score of 0.8. This of course does not necessarily mean and usually does not mean that somebody's individual risk is 80%. Okay, it holds sort of at the group level but it does not hold at the individual level. It doesn't say that this particular instance on their own has this kind of outcome. Okay. 
So one thing that's important to note is that calibration often follows from unconstrained learning. So if you just train a logistic regression model, let's say on, on the UCI adult data, you basically get like a calibrated model, okay? And when a calibrated model looks like this, it, it looks like, um, you know, you sort of get a diagonal line um, when you plot the rate of positive outcomes against the score values, okay? You just get the main diagonal. That's what calibration means. It means that a score decile of two is a 20% chance of positive outcome. Score decile of eight is an 80% chance of positive outcome. And you see that for UCI adult, if you just train an unconstrained logistic regression model, uh, male and female have about, uh, both calibrated. Okay, so within uh, female, within the female population, you get a calibrated model, within the male population, you get a calibrated model. You can prove that this is sort of the thing that happens. Okay, so models tend to be, tend to be calibrated for large detectable groups, but not for small groups, of course, or groups that you can't detect. Um, and there's work on multi-calibration that aims to get you calibration for larger families of subgroups, but it's more complicated. So to some extent, calibration just follows from unconstrained learning. Um, but if you want it for larger or more groups, larger families of groups, you need to work a little bit harder. All right, so to recap what I just said, you have your covariates, your outcome, your risk score, your status, um, and fairness criteria give you different answers to the quality of what question. Uh, there are three common ones, demographic parity, error rate parity, and calibration. And the narratives around algorithmic fairness uh, predominantly sort of focus on one of these three criterias, criteria or their relationship, okay? So I think if you keep those three in mind, you, uh, you know a lot of what's happening in this, in this area. Now, it's kind of interesting that there are uh, uh, four diff uh, two different ways to conceptualize fairness criteria, okay? One of them is as a diagnostic tool to surface different, uh, different moral hazards relating to discrimination. That's kind of how I think about them. I think of them as a diagnostic or a measurement device and they can point you in problematic directions, but they're not a proof of fairness on their own. Um, but some or many actually think of them as kind of algorithmic interventions that you sort of act on that you can superimpose as a constraint on classifiers. That's what you do in learning fair representations when you uh, enforce demographic parity. And there are all sorts of other schemes that either pre-process or do in-training adjustments or post-process. And there are some people that argue that they're neither. Um, so for instance, uh, um, Corbett Davis and Girl uh, have a, um, a survey where they argue that these criteria are neither good diagnostics nor good interventions. Um, and so as you can see, there's even like debate around how you should interpret these criteria. But you know, it's fair to say that many of these 300 plus papers that I mentioned interpret them as algorithmic interventions. So something that you implement as a constraint, something that you achieve uh, in order to make your classifier less problematic, okay? And there are these incompatibility results about these criteria which say that any two of these three criteria are mutually exclusive in general. So for instance, the tension between error rate parity and calibration was sort of became the dominant academic narrative around uh, the ProPublica Compass investigation, okay? So the fact that you can't simultaneously have error rate parity and calibration sort of really occupied academics. So now, with that out of the way, this was just sort of a, a you know, um, context that I think is necessary to appreciate the findings. Um, let me, you know, get to sort of the, uh, the, um, the new insights here that we got from our data sets. So what do we do? As I said, we created new data sets from census public microdata samples, so census pumps data. Um, and we created a software package that wraps around these data sets and it's going to be released shortly. So you're getting a sneak peek here. Uh, Ludwig is typing as we speak on and trying to get it out. Um, and so um, basically what we're gonna release are three prediction problems based on ACS pumps. One uh, that is based on income prediction. It's a plug-in replacement for UCI adult. It's what I'm gonna talk about. The experimental findings are all about that. There's one related to employment. There's one related to health. Um, we look at 50 states and multiple years. So it's, uh, you know, it's sort of a, uh, a set of data sets that lets you talk about you know, distribution shift, both geographically and temporally, um, because there's a lot of variation by state and by year. And so we can study performance variation at, the, at these two levels. And so let me give you just some of these findings um, and you know, we, can, we can discuss them. Um, here, for instance, is something I found interesting. Uh, each plot gives you uh, error rates of a gradient boosting model. 
um, true positive rate on the uh, y-axis and uh, false positive rate on the x-axis for nine different primary uh, racial uh, groups that the census data provides. Uh, and you can see each blue dot is a state. Okay, so in every panel, there are 50, 50 blue dots, 50 states. Um, some of them are missing because there isn't enough data, but uh, there are up to 50 dots in each panel. And you can see just how much variation there is in terms of the true and false positive rates that this model achieves on a state by state basis. So even in the in just the white population, you see that the there is a huge spread um, in, in terms of the trade off between true and false positive rates uh, within the population by state. Okay, and the same, uh, and there's even more variance uh, in, in other populations. And for smaller uh, groups uh, like Native Hawaiian, uh, it's all over the place. Where you know folks who uh, identify as two or more uh, races, uh, again, the trade offs that you get are completely all over the place. Okay, so um, you immediately see when you look at it that there is, uh, even for a single model, a single data set, there's huge variation by state. Um, you can, uh, you know, maybe you're worried that this is just uh, true for uh, gradient boosting is also true for logistic regression. In fact, the variance here is even higher. So just a plain logistic regression model gets, has a lot of variance by state. Um, we also look at, um, sorry, this should be calibration. This is calibration. These are the, um, the calibration curves that you saw earlier. And you can see that you know, for the white population, they're all pretty close to each other in each state. So each line is a state. But again, for uh, smaller groups, you have a lot of by state variance. In many states, you don't even get a calibration curve at all because there is data missing, there's scores missing, there's just not enough um, samples to, to get uh, a calibration curve. Okay, So this is kind of interesting, which shows you that in some sense, these criteria, we always talk about them as if they're some kind of data set property but they actually have huge variation within the data set. And you can't necessarily conceptualize them as just one thing that you know um, you kind of have to trade off, right? So we also look at uh, temporal drift uh, and the effect of temporal drift on accuracy and fairness. Um, one thing that was pretty interesting here is that um, you know, if you look at any of these data sets over time, the performance of models in terms of accuracy typically deteriorates pretty quickly, which is expected. So if you train a model on 2014, you get accuracy about 82.5%. Uh, it deteriorates to uh, 79 point something percent in 2018. Same data sets just four years later, or five years later, um, four years later. Um, but the thing that we always see is that the fairness criteria are more stable, okay? So here, for instance, on the y-axis is the difference between the acceptance rate of the white population and the black population. And it stays constant um, at uh, around 16.5%. Uh, um, yeah, so Tyler is asking why is the uh, you know, loss of accuracy over time expected? Well, this is usually what people call a kind of uh, you know, uh, distribution shift. And so you know, the data changes over time. This is without retraining, right? So you train on 2014, you test on 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018. So you don't get to retrain on these newer states. So your model is spe specialized to 2014 and you don't get to retrain. But interestingly, the fairness criterion stays about the same, okay? So you uh, get the same difference. This is true even if you do interventions. So here we do a threshold adjustment to achieve demographic parity. That's like the simplest adjustment you can get. And if you implement that intervention or you train that intervention on 2014 data and implement it on 2015 through 2018, the effect of that intervention still, it still works. It still gets the difference to zero. The accuracy degrades, but the fairness intervention remains equally uh, you know, effective. This is also true for LFR, the, the Zemo et al. learning fair representations. Also that stays uh, you know, the same over time. However, um, we see that it uh, degrades the performance much more than a simple adjustment. And it also doesn't get the difference down to zero. The difference stays at about 0.1. And so that's actually an interesting difference. You know, uh, LFR uh, worked pretty well on UCI Adult. When you, you know, use our plugin replacement for UCI Adult, it doesn't seem to work so well. 
Okay. Um, here are a bunch of other uh, interesting observations. Um, this plot is basically looking at uh, the effect of an intervention, again, the threshold adjustment uh, to get demographic parity by state. And each arrow is a state uh, before and after intervention. Okay, so you see on the y-axis the uh, difference in acceptance rate, uh, and on the x-axis the accuracy. And each arrow tells you the accuracy and uh, fairness criterion before and after the intervention. And I'm highlighting two states, California and New York. Uh, we should have highlighted Texas. I, I apologize to the organizers for not uh, also highlighting Texas. But basically, I just wanted to have like, you know, two uh, arrows highlighted so they can see what happens. So here, what you see is, for instance, in the New York case, you go from about uh, 81 point something accuracy and a difference of uh, 0.16 down to a difference of zero and an accuracy of, uh, and, you know, 0 0.78 uh, uh, or 78 point something percent. So these arrows tell you sort of how much you're paying for an improvement in the fairness criterion. And as you can see, the threshold adjustment generally gets the difference down pretty quickly, but you pay in accuracy. So now and contrast, sorry. Presumably the arrows that are like pretty vertical are, are they, are they states that have like not so many black people? Yeah, so the states that are gray, that's where we don't have any statistical significance, so we just gray them out. Um, the states that are vertical, um, I, I think are sort of the states where it's working the best, right? I mean, that's where you like pay nothing in terms of accuracy and you get the full improvement in terms of difference, right? So contrast this with, um, you know, or, or here, what you, what you see here is uh, you see all the arrows get more flat. This is because on the y-axis, we now look at the difference in true positive rate. And so we're doing an, uh, you know, an intervention to achieve demographic parity, and we're looking at the effect on uh, true positive rates, and we see that you know even though it's a, an intervention for a different fairness criterion, it doesn't actually deteriorate the true positive rates. In fact, the true positive rates also sort of start looking better. The difference, uh, so that means that you don't necessarily see a tension in these two criteria um, uh, in, in concrete settings. Okay. So here's the same thing, but for learning fair representations, that's the Zimolite uh, pre-processing that's, uh, you know, um, doesn't seem to work so well here. So it doesn't improve the difference in acceptance rates much, but you still pay a pretty steep price in terms of accuracy. So these arrows kind of quickly tell you, uh, you know, what's happening. And also what's kind of interesting, it doesn't work so well for the uh, acceptance rates it also doesn't seem to work for true positive rates. So, or, or the effect on true positive rates is much worse as well. Okay, so it tends to deteriorate that difference. All right, so with those plots sort of, uh, you know, out of the way, I'm just gonna draw some conclusions and wrap up because I'm kind of out of time. So uh, what we're seeing and what's kind of challenging for this area, I think, is that the effectiveness of interventions varies greatly by context. We can't conceptualize these things as sort of being static properties of a data set. Uh, there's a lot of uh, variation within the data set, and you have to ask yourself, so what is the right locus for intervention? Is it country, state, county, city? What, what are we even talking about? What are these trade-offs, and where do we, what do we train on? What is our population, right? And so, as we know from you know, causality and discussions around Simpson's paradox and so on, there's no answer here without substantive knowledge, right? We need to make some more assumptions to resolve that, but it can't be done at, at a purely statistical level, okay? Also, these trade-offs between criteria are highly specific to subpopulations, and the effects of interventions on secondary criteria are specific to the method and subpopulation are often hard to foresee. So if you implement a fairness uh, uh, intervention, uh, it's, it, it's hard to predict what it's gonna do for other criteria and in what context. Also, one thing we note, uh, noted is that the code developed for UCI adult often struggles with seemingly very similar data sets. Okay, so there's some, some work to do on the software side for, for this community. Um, so the main takeaways, I think the community sort of recognized the importance of data sets, but the data and software ecosystem that we rely on as researchers still is lagging. Um, and so we sort of identify census data products as a rich resource for new high quality data sets. And we make them accessible with a new software package that's to be released shortly. Um, that makes easy access uh, to these census data sets and provides several ready to use data sets, including a plug-in replacement for UCI adults. So if you get the package in a couple of weeks, please all 
evaluate your UCI adult code to uh, on these new data sets, see what happens, tell us about it. And certainly what we're seeing is that distribution shift and intra data set variation pose challenges to both how we think about uh, algorithmic interventions in this context and also what they actually do. Okay, in particular narratives about discrimination that rely on these statistics uh, are specific to population and method and they should be regarded as such. Okay, so I feel like the often in, for instance, in the compass setting, we, we talked about these tensions between these criteria as if they're sort of one fixed thing, right? But these are actually very uh, population and method specific claims. And so we need to be a little bit more accurate in what we're actually talking about. Okay, so uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, happy to answer more questions. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks Moritz, that, that was a lot of fun. Um, enjoyed learning about that. Um, any, any, any questions for Moritz? I had a question. So you said that it doesn't make sense to use the sampling weights for prediction, but if your sampling weights are because like, you had different sampling of different populations, then you want to predict the underlying population rather than your sample. And so shouldn't you use that in your evaluation? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, and I'm not, so I think I would draw a difference between should you use it in your evaluation and should you use it in your classifier, right? Because I think when you think about sort of a typical screening and decision making setting, the decision maker wouldn't have access to sampling weights. But you right? know, your sense is got because it knows how it shows who to send the survey to. No, but let's say you're you're making employment decisions over at a company, right? Uh, you, I guess you could go about it as in like, you know, we're going to sort of model our population, you know, figure out the sampling weights and, you know, uh, adjust in our decisions, right? But that's currently not being done, right? Uh, at least not as far as I know. I mean, look, first of all, Eric, uh, maybe, right? I'm not saying no, I'm just saying, you know, it's not a feature of the individual, right? Like it's it's a little bit of a weird thing to featureize because it's a property of the the the. But it's the, saying that this person really represents more more actual people in the underlying population than this other sampled person in your data set. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a good point. I you know it's uh, I guess it's a. Uh, um, uh, you, I, I'm not saying you're wrong. I, I just think it's it's sort of you know uh, takes a moment of thought to figure out if this is what you want to be doing. Uh, to me, it's sort of um, it's not a feature that I expect a decision maker to have access to. Let me ask a different question. I notice on these data sets, you're you know, it's still interesting to run these classifiers that, you know, relative to say deep nets are kind of computationally not very intensive. Do we need a, a data set that, uh, you know, to, st to study these issues that, that is more computationally intensive, that is larger, that, you know, is, is something on, on more akin to ImageNet? Yeah, so there's uh, definitely been a lot of work on um, on the vision side. You know, I mentioned the work of um, Abu Lamrini and Gebru. So there's been a lot of recognition around the uh, the uh, the representational issues with vision data sets like ImageNet and so on. And there's been work to like create data sets that address those issues. Um, so there's there's certainly uh, work on that front in the vision uh, and and deep learning community, um, but. Uh, you know, here we're sort of studying these, uh, what I call actuarial data sets. So like small number of features, you know, more like insurance application, you know, um, employment stuff, right? So I feel like a lot of the, the um, a lot of interesting settings of uh, where, you know, discrimination comes up are on these kind of data sets, right? So I, I agree that, you know, I'm not saying the, the, the vision data sets are not, you know, they're important for some things, but I also actually want to emphasize the significance of these kind of tabular data sets. Yeah, category with categorical features. Yeah, categorical features, small tabular data for uh, policy relevant questions, right? The criminal okay. assessment, employment, hiring, insurance, et cetera. Um, you know, they all work with these, uh, you know, uh, uh, categorical uh, tabular data sets. And so I think it's actually pretty important 
it's sort of like kind of the ugly duckling, right? Nobody wants to like uh, you know, admit that they're doing something with tabula data, right? It's more attractive to do something with like, you know, uh, pixels. But I think, you know, for the policy, from a policy perspective, it's pretty important that we don't forget about the fact that, well, a lot of like statistical decision-making works with these kind of data sets, right? And, and one other thing uh, that often, maybe I, I was sort of hoping Morris might touch on this, so maybe he can, he can react to my, my question. So uh, many data sets, including but not limited to all of these image data sets, they don't have the sort of like additional feature or metadata or even something that would be easy to infer uh, something about protected categories from, right? So, so you know, fortunately for us, uh, you know, if something is closely enough tied to, to either like census data or, or something else, maybe we can infer something uh, about, about gender, race, something else. Uh, but once we get into <laughs> images, right, it's, it's very unclear how to guess or how to, how, how we should make decisions about like, you know, it basically requires hand labeling, right, as far as I can tell to, to try to guess who, who belongs to an image and sort of what race or gender they identify as, right, uh, especially the, I was talking to Lubick about this recently, there's like absolutely no like sense of asking people whether they want to belong to an image data set. At least that has largely overwhelmingly not been the case. And if we haven't even asked if they want to belong to a data set, we have no way to like understand more nuanced things about them. Yeah, those are all good points, right? And so the the the, the um, papers that I mentioned, which point out some of these issues, right? I mean, that's you know issues like consent, representation, uh, you know, uh, labeling of you know. Uh, 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 various uh, kinds, right? I mean, that's that sort of issues that the Census Bureau has like a long tradition of trying to address, right? And so I think, you know, it is a pretty attractive data source because they go through such pain to like figure out, uh, uh, you know, uh, a racial encoding that is suitable for the U.S. population and figure out how to collect that and and you know get consent and so on. And so. Um, that's why I sort of, as a researcher, feel com more comfortable kind of working with these kind of data sets for these research purposes. So, but yeah, so I, maybe I should have said, Adam, um, and, and also going to, uh, to Jamie's question, there is a whole lot of work on the deep learning vision side of, of pixels and whatnot. Uh, this is sort of like, this talk was about the tabula world where I think a lot of decisions happen and we're not talking a lot about it as a research community. Um, yeah, I was more wondering if you were trying to come up with a tabular or categorical data set that was, you know, super large or super, you know, so you could run a bunch yeah. of different types of classifiers on it. Yeah, so we, we are, right? I mean, the, um, the, um, the ACS PUMS data is pretty big, right? You can, you know, if you throw in all the features and the whatever, um, two million, two and a half million data points, it's not oh, okay. So, okay. It, like computationally crazy, but um, it, no, that's, it, that's pretty good. Yeah, it is not small anymore, right? It is sort of, uh, it is big enough to like give you a bit of a, um, you know, playground for different classifiers and models and also possibly, I mean, we don't know yet, but possibly there's also just more room for improvement than there was in UCI Delt because in UCI Delt, you just kind of max out pretty quickly. Yeah. So there's hope that here there's a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, a little more room to explore what's possible. Okay, well, I mean, thanks again, Moritz, for being here, though. That, that was really fun. Uh, I think we all enjoyed learning about that. And let me just say again, his book, when is your book Patterns, Predictions, and Actions with Ben Recht? When is that coming out? That is, um, you know, it's basically done and online. We're um, oh, okay. closing the contract with a publisher uh, to be announced shortly. We're also doing a bug a bug uh, bounty where you can get signed copies of the uh, edition if you find bugs. You can get a head start on that um, by you know I'll type it in, uh, go into this website and uh, finding bugs. Uh, you can get a get a free copy. So that's happening pretty soon. Uh, the 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 fairness book that's more relevant to this talk that got a little bit delayed uh, for uh, for personal reasons, but that too should appear next year. So. Oh, great. Awesome. We're basically okay. wrapping that up pretty quickly too. 
All right, thank you so much. This was fun, and thanks for bearing with me as I talked about this this new uh, new topic. And uh, you know, thanks for your questions. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Thanks a lot, Mart. All right, take care. Bye. Bye.